let you glance at them up on the, on the board. Uh, these are folks who um, have spent a lot of time uh, recruiting speakers, um, uh, seeking funding to uh, travel folks, um, and uh, to help with our logistics of this meeting. And, I, and we are very grateful to all of them. Uh, we also have our um, advisory board for our institute, and they have been uh, giving us some key uh, advice uh, and uh, have helped us hone down on some of the priorities for today. And I wanted, again, to also acknowledge them without necessarily reading out names, but you can glance and see if you have any friends of yours uh, or colleagues uh, who are on this list. Uh, finally, I'd like to acknowledge the faculty and staff uh, of the uh, um, institute who helped with the Global Health Forum. This is not a comprehensive uh, list of, of the folks working with us, but. It is the, the folks who made unusual contributions to what we are sure will be a very uh, inspiring and stimulating day. I hope I'm not going too fast for you to eyeball these names because we want to give credit to everyone. And I also wanted to ask, uh, could uh, we ask everyone who is uh, presenting today, the speakers and presenters, just to stand for a moment so that folks can see who you are. Why, everybody who's participating as a speaker or a presenter, just stand up for a moment. So you see it's a, it's a non-trivial subset of the, of the audience. And we really want to thank you in advance uh, because as the day goes on, uh, we break up into small working groups and, uh, and we are not together quite as much. Finally, we do have some expenses related here and we thank you for um, paying a fee to come today uh, to enable us to cover those expenses. Uh, we had um, um, special support from the university and from the medical center, uh, and then all of these other uh, entities, uh, Caldwell Travel, the uh, International Student and Scholar Services uh, of the university, the Pita Pit, um, Marriott Hotels, and the Gray Umbrella also provided concrete uh, fiscal or in-kind support for the day, and we wanted to acknowledge all of them. So without uh, further ado, I wanted to introduce the Reverend Ann Walling. Ann, as you saw, is a member of our organizing committee, and I learned just this morning that in uh, 2002, she got involved uh, with uh, the Mekong Project that uh, our, our uh, guest is going to be, um, uh, guest plenary speaker is going to be telling us about, 
And I really want to introduce and introduce our plenary speaker. the Stung Tring Women's Development Center. Occasionally, each of our paths happen across another path and we find ourselves in the midst of a delightful and unexpected ex experience. In 2002, my path began to converge with that of Nguan Chanta, and wonderful things happened for both of us. As our, as our paths crossed, we, we found new and wonderful things in both of our lives, and it's my good fortune to be able to introduce her to you today. Chanta and her husband Chan not only survived the murderous reign of the Khmer Rouge, they brought from it a passion to rebuild their country and a compassionate heart for a people of grief. They and almost everyone they knew suffered unspeakable hardship and loss. Chanta's heart was drawn to the desperation of, the young, of young women and especially to those in Stung, in Stung Tring province. I won't tell you her story, she will tell you much of it. But what Chanta accomplished and is accomplishing was to turn despair into joy. After fleeing to Vietnam and subsequently living in refugee camps, she returned to, to a home that no longer existed, to poverty that was unspeakable, to a people and a land of desolation. Young girls were and are especially vulnerable. Some were sold as slaves to rich families. Some were forced into the sex trade. HIV AIDS became prevalent. Death was in the air. But despite that dark lens, Chanta saw through to a world and a people that she loved. She could see joy. Chanta's passion and compassion led her down several roads that eventually merged into the Stung Tring Women's Development Center in Stung Tring, Cambodia. The women there are cared for, educated, taught to weave silk, and taught that dignity and respect are their birthright. They earn a living wage as Cambodian artisans. There's a Khmer saying, man is gold and woman is a skirt. At the Stung Tring Women's Development Center, man is gold, yes, but woman is a diamond. It is my joy to present to you the woman who saw much pain and turned it into much joy for the women of Stung Tring, Cambodia, a woman of unbridled spirit, a woman of unfailing courage, a woman of joy, Nguan Chanta. We're having some uh, technical problems, so we can't actually blow it up to fill the whole screen, but we might be able to blow it up to fill a little bigger than it is now. So you can start if you'd like. I'm just going to fiddle, fiddle with this. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is the neighborhood of Stung Trang Women's Devel Development Center. And the woman here is my own image when I'm at home. My big thanks to Vanderbilt Institute for Global Health for providing me an honorable opportunity to be here today. 
my special thanks to the Reverend Ann Walling for offering me a great chance to be Cinderella for a second time together with my children. And I have 30 minutes before I get back to my pumpkin to present to you what we are doing to help improve women's and children's health in our community. This is um, some landscape in Stuntrang, which is very, very beautiful sunrise on Sekong River and sunset on Mekong River. The river is two miles wide at Stuntrang town, and in the rainy season, the water rises by 30 feet. Stung Trang is an ideal location for wildlife lovers. The total land area of Cambodia is about one and a half times the state of Tennessee. Cambodia is 69,900 square miles and Tennessee is 42,143 square miles. In 1979, just after the Civil War, the road from Stung Trang to Phnom Penh was impassable. People had to travel from Stung Trang, that's where Stung Trang is, yeah, and then through Ratanakiri and Vietnam, part, half of Vietnam to go to Phnom Penh, to go to Saigon, and then from Saigon, go to Phnom Penh. It took about three to four days for people to get from Stung Trang to Phnom Penh in 1979. Yeah. Before I present to you the establishment of Stung Trang Women's Development Center, please permit me to show you the reason why I have chosen Stung Trang, the province in the northeastern of Cambodia, where up to 2001 was considered the end of the world. My father died when I was very young. And in 1974, one year before the communist army from the north took over the south in Vietnam, my mother sent my two sisters, my two brothers, to stay with a relative in Saigon. I was 13 years old at the time. My mother stayed behind with my brother to arrange for the sale of our home. This was the last time I saw my brother. My mother later arrived in Vietnam after escaping the Khmer Rouge following the mass evacuation of Phnom Penh in April 75. We had survived the Khmer Rouge, but life was still a struggle. As a high school student in 1980 in Saigon, my dream was to be a medical doctor because I love to work with patients. The medical university in Saigon only selected students whose parents were soldiers that had sacrificed their lives during the war, which I was not. The only option for high school graduated students like myself was to go to teaching training college. When my mother passed away in 1984, my dream then had switched from to be a doctor to just having enough food every day to survive. Having enough food to survive was also a dream that made millions and millions of people leave Vietnam. Millions died doing so, trying to reach a third country. We arrived in the refugee camp in Thailand through Cambodia border in August 1984, just 14 days after the third countries, such as France, Australia, England, and some countries in East Europe closed their doors to the refugees who came from Vietnam or Cambodia. Only America was still accepting refugees, but then we had to get through the screening for political asylum purpose. It meant families of soldiers who joined the U.S. Army during the war in Vietnam. My refugee status was turned down because I was not fit the criteria. In 1986, I married Kim Darajan, who had been part of our group from Cambodia to the refugee camp. I and Kim Darajan, my husband, we came back to Cambodia for the first election in 1993. We had no jobs and no dreams. As civil war still continued along Thai border, it was extremely dangerous to get work in the provinces in the West 
we entered a new adventure. We dig gold in the forest in Ratanakiri, a province in the northeast neighboring Stung Treng. The place where we located was 20 miles work from the main town. Working was the sole option. For almost one year, we found no gold, but malaria regularly every two weeks. And in the dry season, the only food we could get was rice and salt. This could ex explain the population of indigenous group in the area remained small. Most of the children died before they were five years old from malaria and malnutrition. It was on our way from Ratanakiri back to Phnom Penh in late 1994 that we passed Tung Treng for the first time. I knew immediately that I want to live in this place. I was attracted by the beautiful rivers and green forests. Apart from the isolation from other neighboring provinces, the geographic situation of Stung Treng province is unique in Cambodia. Much of the province is heavily forested. With its total population of 120,000, it has the second lowest population density in the country, which is 20 people per square mile. The average household size is 5.3, the highest in the country. 73% of the population living in rural villages, some of which are on islands. The four major rivers that run through the province isolate the population and ensuring that travel is both difficult and expensive. During the 1970s, the Khmer Rouge regime systematically dismantled Cambodia's health care infrastructure and killed almost two million people, particularly those of the ed educated and professional classes. It is estimated that only 10 to 50 physicians survived the regime. Following three decades of civil unrest, it was not until the mid-1990s that Cambodia's health sector began its recovery. In 2002, Cambodia has 0 0.16 doctors per 1,000 people, and USA has 2.2 doctors per 1,000 people. The United States has 14 times more doctors per 1,000 people than Cambodia. Cambodia has a population of less than 14 million and a per capita GDP of 450 US dollars in 2005. 635 US dollars in 2008. Today, Cambodia ranks 128th of 174 countries in the United Nations Human Development Index in terms of wealth, with a per capita GDP of 783 US dollars. Approximately 80% of the population live in rural areas are engaged, mainly in subsistence agriculture. Seven out of 10 of Cambodians live on less than two US dollars per day. The source is from UNDP 2009. Cambodia spends 17 US dollars per person on health, ranked 110 out of 133 countries. USA spends $4,271 per person, ranked number one out of 133. More than 250 times than Cambodia, and the source is from World Development Indicators. Cambodia is ranked number two out of 185 countries for health spending as a 12% out of GDP. USA is ranked number one out of 185 countries of 14.6%. Cambodia is 41 places above Japan and 45 places above the UK. The source is from WHO. One in 12 Cambodian, Cambodian children do not survive until their fifth birthday. Approximately 60% of Cambodian women have less than primary school education. The source is from JICA and UNFPA in 2009. Annual government spending on health is eight US dollars per person, meaning patients must absorb 75% of health care costs out of pocket. 
It's from WHO 2009 results. 80% of Cambodians must go into debt using savings or sell off their livelihood assets in order to pay for medical treatments, making illness the leading cause of new poverty. This is a MSF pilot project to build to bring mobile team health care to remote village in Stung in 1995 to 2000. Up until 1995, I was working with Doctors Without Border or Médecins Sans Frontières. At the time, there were only two NGOs working in Stung Treng province, compared to 150 NGOs in Siem Reap province, where the Angkor temples are located. In Stung Treng, children died from dengue fever, diarrhea, severe malnourished. Women died from complicated delivery. Transportation was difficult and expensive. People would normally seek help from local traditional healer. By the time they did arrive at the health center or hospital, it was usually too late to save them. I remember a 14-year-old boy who had open broken leg arrived at the hospital in a hammock carried by his father and his brother after two days' work from their village. We had tried to convince a father to give blood to his 13-year-old daughter who had severe malaria, which caused severe anemia. He said, I cannot, I will die if I give her my blood. And the small girl was immediately told us in tears, let me die, don't take my father's blood. The MSF pilot mobile team has brought curative and preventive health care re and referral system to the health center or hospital to the remote villages in the east of Stung Treng along Sesan River, where the population was described by government or NGOs as low knowledge and poor. However, MSF could only treat the disease but could not provide food to improve people's health. The model of MSF mobile team has been adopted by Ministry of Health to continue to date. The MSF HIV AIDS prevention program focused on high risk population such as military, police and sex workers, which was provide treatment for STI and HIV AIDS awareness. Discrimination was extremely strong toward HIV AIDS patients. The same with TB patients. If the community found out one person had TB, the whole family would be seg segregated from the community as people believe TB is a genetic disease and incurable. One of my tasks was to provide social support to AIDS patients in the hospital who had no family. Most of them were sex workers. Our aim was to help them die in dignity. This had been the reason that made me set up a hospice after MSF closed the project that primarily led to the development of Stung Treng Women's Development Center, which I will discuss in more detail in a few minutes. With that new dream in mind, I had worked for voluntary service overseas UK in order to save funding for the Stung Treng Women's Development Center and to fulfill my dream. From this experience, I have become convinced that the essential components of any project such as Tung Treng Women's Development Center must include education, health, and livelihoods combined together in an integrated program. And I believed it must focus on women. As we all know, to educate a man, it's one person get educated to educate a woman, the whole family get educated. Cambodian society has enforced 10 rules upon women called the Chabab Srei, which means the law for women. Women are therefore expected to primarily work and behave as housewives, to respect and serve their husbands, as well as friends of the husbands, to take care of the children, not to make eye contact when talking to people who has higher authority and not to travel alone. Traditional culture has ranked women in comparison to men by stating, or in other words, man is gold and woman is a skirt. Therefore, 
no matter how badly the man behaves, he is still considered gold and free to change as many skirts as he wishes. And a woman's value remains only that of a skirt. It is for these reasons that in Cambodia, women only need a husband and not an education. Limited educational opportunities, poor nutrition, and lack of decision-making power contributes significantly to adverse health outcomes. Laws and policies such as those that require a woman to first obtain permission from her husband or parents also discourage women and girls from seeking needed health care services. Cambodia has achieved remarkable success reducing HIV AIDS infection by half and bringing the majority of affected people under treatment. Yet, maternal mortality remains tragically high. Infectious disease are serious concerns, and the health care and education systems are underfunded. But maternal deaths only tell part of the story. For every woman or girl who dies as a result of pregnancy-related causes, between 20 and 30 more will develop short and long-term disabilities such as obstetric fistula a ruptured uterus. The best estimates for Cambodia suggest that approximately 2,900 women and girls die each year due to pregnancy-related complications. Additionally, another 58,000 to 87,000 Cambodian women and girls mm -hmm will suffer from disabilities caused by complication during pregnancy and childbirth each year. And the resources from USAID. Here are some statistics show women's health status. Since 2000, the country's maternal mortality rate has actually increased. The lifetime risk of maternal deaths in Cambodia is 1 in 48, and maternal deaths account for 1 out of 6 deaths among women aged 15 to 49 years. Only 27% of Cambodian women received the WHO recommended minimum of 4 antenatal visits. Only 22% of expectant mothers delivered in an institutional setting. One in three Cambodian women lack access to care in the postnatal period, which caused more than half of maternal deaths and one-third of child deaths. Married women constitute almost 50% of new HIV infection, and mother-to-child transmission accounts for another 33%. Together, women and infants account for 83% of those most at risk of new infection. Cervical cancer and breast cancer are the top two cancers in Cambodia. Incidence not known, higher incidence in cervical cancer for HIV-positive women. Overall, Cambodian women with breast cancer face mortality rates of 41%. The source is from Center of Hope, Cambodia. National budget for non-communicable disease, including cancer, mental health, diabetes, hypertension, is 1% of total budget for health. One out of seven children under age of five is severely malnourished. Four out of 10 are chronically malnourished. Average number of children in each family is seven. 39.5% of children are stunted, over 17 times higher than the person expected in a healthy population. Acute malnutrition in poor urban children increased to 15.9% in 2008 from 9.6% in 2005. 
and the source is Cambodia Anthropometric Survey in 2008. Rural poverty account for almost 90% of poverty in Cambodia, which in turn has impacted infant mortality rates, with the current rate reaching 58 infant deaths per 1,000 live births one of the highest rates in Southeast Asia. The source is general population census in Cambodia, 2008. 65,000 people are infected with tuberculosis each year in Cambodia. In 2009, TB killed 71 people for every 100,000 Cambodian. And the source is from WHO for TB profile. And this is the home of Women's Development Center. Stung Treng Women's Development Center was originally conceived in 2001 as a hospice called the Center of Destination. The hospice assisted the Maloney ill and homeless patients in the Stung Treng provincial area who are infected with HIV AIDS and terminally ill. At the same time, following the national project to empower women called Neri Ratana, or in other words, woman is diamond. The Stung Treng Women's Development Center was established in December 2001 that has served Srepo village in the greater Stung Treng community. The low quality of life of this community is an example for the results of decades of war and political upheaval resulting in a very limited opportunities. It was realized that by offering health education, including HIV AIDS, could significantly raise the awareness of HIV AIDS and preventive behavior. Additionally, by offering literacy education, vocational training program, and employment opportunities, people would develop skills, provide income generation, and improving living standards. Stung Treng Women's Development Center is a Cambodian-based humanitarian NGO focusing on developing life skills that assist in breaking the cycle of poverty and illiteracy for vulnerable people, especially women. Our projects are developed to empower and support while providing knowledge and skills that have long-term benefit. Our program. Currently, government-initiated employment and educational efforts are not sufficient to meet the demand. It is imperative that organizations like SWDC attempt to meet those needs in the interim. SWDC has developed two distinct purposes as a social enterprise of making Mekong Blue Silk products and as a social welfare provider for the village and surrounding community. Our programs, education program in literacy and health for women, a kindergarten to take care and provide uh, support in child care, uh, provide breakfast and learning, education program and school sponsorship for children in primary school up to grade nine in lower primary, uh, their secondary school. Vocational training in traditional weaving, training in carpentry and building, training in employment for sericulture, employment at our production center for Mekong Blue, employment at our cafe and gallery, employment at our sericulture program, and we provide a bike for trainees so that the mother and child can go to the center. Nutrition program, we grow vegetable that can be used for the trainee and the uh, weavers. Sericulture program. We start with a small house in Stung Trang Town, a 3,000 US dollars donation, two weaving looms, and a big dreams. We have grown quickly by understanding how important the income generation helps to make change in their lives, including living standard, health, and education for themselves and their family. 
women who join SWDC follow our work principle, that being perseverance. We will not have better lives unless we both learn and work hard. At the center, we work together not only with care and respect, but it is also done with the principle of fairness. The women learn to take responsibility for their own work, and according to their training, to produce the best quality of products possible. In order to be able to do this, the weaver not only needs the skill, but also needs patience while taking great care of her work. Their efforts have resulted in the production of silk products of exceptional quality. These have been awarded with UNESCO seal of excellence for handicraft products in Southeast Asia and are marketed under the brand name Mekong Blue. Mekong Blue has been selected from over 400 applicants to participate the 2011 Santa Fe International Folk Art Market in July in New Mexico, USA. This is the first time Cambodia is selected, represented by Mekong Blue, to attend this unique art fair. We currently have 90 staff, which includes a team of 80 weavers, whose salaries vary between 75 to 200 US dollars per month. One need to bear in mind that a primary school teacher's salary is 40 US dollars per month, and a medical doctor is 150 US dollars per month. Now, with their own income, they can not only support themselves and their parents, but they can even choose the man they want to marry to. Moreover, they realize that they are now independent, which also means freedom. They are free from poverty. In the period between 2002 and 2010, SWDC has benefited the lives of over 500 women, 700 children, and directly assisted many families from the poor village in the local area. In addition, there are other 600 families who are indirect beneficiaries, such as family members who can receive better health care and access to education after women in their family are able to utilize the existing health care system, provide preventative care at home, and can better support the family economically. And here are some stories that I would like to show Bonti, age three, when he arrived at SWDC, he, has se he was severely malnourished, and I, I had uh, nursed him back to life. Uh, with, with my experience, we are working with doctors without border, and now he is in grade five. Malua, she got polio when she was five years old, and 12 years ago, I met her when the mobile team of MSF went to the village and she lived along the river and she was pregnant because the woman need a child to support her when she, uh, she, oh, she, she, she's older. And she didn't know that polio, she cannot have a child. So we took her and take care of her until she was full term and gave her cesarean. And uh, we became friends since, but the only thing I can, I can support her was to give her a bit of money every time. And then she ended up next to my uh, house. She became my neighbor. And um, uh, the way I support her is not sustainable, but she, she has two good arms. So we provide her a job, spinning uh, silk, and uh, provide her a piece of land and build her a house. And now, she is a breadwinner for her husband. He become her dependent and she made $80 a month. Run, one of the first four weavers in 2001. She's currently one of the four leaders. So Pierre also one of the first four weavers in 2001. And you see, a um, few years ago, she lives in a house like that and now she has a house and she married and she's one of the four leaders as well. Tiang married with two children and she's one of the best weaver and one of the first, first weaver we have. And she's the one who made 200 US dollars a month. 
uh, Mon also one of the best weaver, and she had to leave SWDC because her family has a better business. The number of weavers in 2004, and in 2009 we grow to more than double, and this is in 2010, uh, where we are. SWDC has since become a role model for social enterprise and for best practice of fair trade. Artisans Association of Cambodia always chose SWDC to conduct a study visit trip for fair trade training. Challenges are part of our organization. Without challenges, we would not be called the Trang Women's Development Center. Funding was our main challenge. The only challenge that beyond our capability to get over by ourselves. The same as the whole country, we heavily depended on donation. The recent global economic downturn make us more challenges. Local products such as handicraft have become hard to sell as number of tourists visiting Cambodia has fallen as well. Unemployment among government workers has hit hard as the US and European countries have cut import of government produce in Cambodia by 27% in the first five months of 2009. And construction activities dried up, which have slashed the much needed income of many thousands of workers in the service sector. Consequently, hunger and poverty have taken a stronger hold on the lives of many rural people. Please note that the economy of Cambodia relies on three sectors, government factory, tourism, agriculture, and construction. However, in 2009, SWDC launched its first online store in the U.S., which has contributed to an increase in sales of 46% compared to 2008 figures, and it shows promise for greater growth. And um, and as we learn to grow, we, uh, we have a greater dream that we will have a, a bigger and stronger team of independent women and uh, with your support, we would like to share with you our vision of a society where women are respected as a productive citizen. Thank you. Have some time for questions for Chanta if anybody would like to ask one or of Anne, who's responsible for having her here. Anywhere? Yes. Would you like to answer? The, the store, it's an online store. It's called bluesilk.org. And there's a display in the room right next door. And we would love for you to go pick up a brochure and look at some of the silk products that Chanta makes. And um, so the, the store is now about a year and a half old and uh, it's been a, a wonderful thing for all of us. Shanta, how did you decide to do silk? And were the women that you selected already weavers? Um, are there other products that you're hoping to develop? We decided to do silk because silk weaving is our traditional uh, long lost during the war. And to revive the long lost traditional culture art, also uh, we have an idea to adopt the traditional into Western because we try to reach the high-end Western market. So this is the point that we can survive, we can revive, but also we can survive. Um, so how much funding do you need to have to make all of this work, and at what point do you think the um, program will be self-sustainable? 
Can you please ask again, please? Um, at, at what point do you think this do you think this project will ever be self sustainable, or do you think you'll always be reliant on donors? Uh, we try to reach our self sustainable in a few years time, but one of our board director had had said. I heard you say you want to be sustainable in since 2003, but now we still have to depend on a bit of 35% uh, of our budget uh, from donation because we have still have social program like kindergarten, uh, free lunch for weavers to, uh, uh, to help them to cut down the workload. They don't have to cook their own lunch after work. And we have a school sponsorship program, which is we still, um, depend on donation, rely on donation. But 100% of the production unit, 80, 80 weavers who receive $75 to $200 US per month, we are totally self-sustained on that. And we can, we are able to pay part of the social program, the running cost of the social program. So we, we hope in the next few years the sale will increase to $200,000, $300,000 per month, and we are able to be 100% uh, uh, sale sustained. Good morning. In looking at the population and the infant mortality that you have among women there, what type of preconception health are you giving them and not where they're not having babies right after each other and putting some space in between? And also you said most of the families have at least seven children in the family. How many of them have had a miscarriage or had a baby that has died? Um, because I have many years working in the rural community in the Trang province, and I believe it's uh, very similar to other provinces in Cambodia. Each women, uh, because we believe uh, women has to make baby and take care of the baby. So family planning is, uh, is not very welcome in, in the poor community. So we believe each other that if we take contraception, we will have vaginal discharge. So we will have as many as babies as uh, God wish or something. So at least one woman give birth to nine, from nine to 11 times. And the survival children is between five to seven. Yeah, yeah. May I make a comment here? Um, one other comment that uh, on that that uh, I've heard uh, Chantal comment on before is that one of the best forms of birth control is an educated woman. The educated, the more education a woman has, the fewer children they're likely to have, and that's part of the, one of the things the Stung Tring Women's Development Center is doing is providing education for the girls as well as the boys. Thank you. In your silk production, are you also involved in uh, the production of uh, the mulberry and the silk worms or just in the uh, weaving process? Uh, yes, uh, we produce um, raw silk threads uh, in a very, very um, low scale, uh, and we hope we can uh, make it bigger in, in a bigger scale to, uh, to be able to cover our own uh, demand. There may be people here who are interested in linking with uh, with you and Stung Trang. Are there opportunities for uh, for linkages uh, for um, uh, workers, for students, uh, or in, from between uh, Middle Tennessee and Stung Trang? Uh, we are welcome volunteers, and we have uh, volunteers coming with us and. Uh, I uh, warranty you, we have many things for you to do. <laughs> you are all needed. And if anyone is interested in pursuing that, they can contact me and I will give you all the contact information and get you in contact with 
Chanta in Cambodia. I'm Carol Etherington. I'm one of the associate directors at the Institute and wanted to just um, also add some perspectives from an expat's experience working in the camps that Chanza just described to us. That happened to be my first global experience and it, 31 years later, remains the cornerstone of my global experience. <clears throat> It's the one that blindsides me still, as you can tell. But I think um, for my colleagues and, and, and for myself who were there, it was the first time that we, as Chanta pointed out, um, the, the experience was overwhelming. And it was the first time we had seen adults and children literally fall over and die from starvation. It was my first experience of having massive numbers of people die from cholera. It was the first time I had ever seen somebody survive a landmine injury and walk in um, with a limb amputated but still survive it. So there were many, many firsts. And I think for uh, many colleagues and myself, it does remain sort of that, that place in our minds that if a place and a country like Cambodia can come back from that abject horror that the people experienced, then there's extraordinary hope for all kinds of events that we see happening around us today. The, um, the resilience of people, I think, is, is very memorable to me at that time. But to hear you today, personally and professionally, is a healing piece for me. I also think it says to us, as persons who have a commitment to global health, whether that's here or abroad, that we always have to remember after catastrophic events and after things especially like wars and genocides, there isn't, despite massive aid that goes into a country, an ascending spiral that everything is OK and will be OK. It is always something that has dips and successes, and di dips again and successes. And I think the statistics that you're showing us just from the last 10 years says that. But lastly, I think that it says to us um, that there is a reason we're all gathered here today. And that is that the commitment to the well-being of people around the globe is exactly what we're supposed to be about. And so you have set the stage for us to go forward on this day in a most unique way. And I, again, personally and professionally, thank you.